Lady asks, before we begin to talk, would it be possible to meditate together? I'm afraid that word meditation has been so misused. There are so many systems of meditation the Tibetan, the Chinese, the Hindu, the Buddhist. I don't know what you mean by meditation. To me, personally, meditation is something that cannot be cultivated, practiced, followed a system. It must come naturally, like a flower that blooms, You can't force it. So I don't know what you mean by meditation together. Talk, talk, together. talk together. We have been doing that for the last two times that we met here. Would you please sit down? We'll go on. We were talking the last time that we met here, the before yesterday, whether there is any possibility in the whole structure and the nature of the mind, in which is included all the feelings, sensations, matter and so on, is there a field where thought, which is of time, has never touched it? And it is very important, it seems to me, to find that out, not from what the speaker has told, but for yourself, to find out or to discover naturally and easily, without effort, through deep investigation and objective, non-neurotic observation, whether there is that area where all the conditioning doesn't exist at all. Because as we said the other day, when we live as we do, in the area of knowledge, which is our conditioning, then all action, whatever it be, however noble, however idealistic, must invariably be mechanical. Through centuries upon um, centuries, our brains have been cultivated to comply, to accept, or go to the opposite, not to comply, not to accept, which is the same pattern, both the negative and the positive. And therefore, Living in that area, naturally, all our actions must be mechanical. 
because our actions are based on either reward or on punishment. The reward which thought has projected, or the punishment which thought has projected, and thought is the response of knowledge, and therefore mechanical. I hope we are meeting this. This is very important to understand, because is there an area where there is non-mechanistic action, non-computerized action, not an idea? So it is very important to find out, because our lives, as one observes, most unfortunately, are repetitive, both sexually, in every direction, repetitive, and conformative, or suppressing, or yielding to the various demands, both psychological and physiological. And so, when you observe your actions, it is essentially based on the past as memory, which is mechanical, and to discover for oneself, not repeat what others have said, but for oneself, that is, oneself being the total essence of humanity. That one must be absolutely clear, that you are not a separate individual. You are the result of centuries of conditioning, like everyone else in the world, conditioned in sorrow, to accept sorrow, to live with fear, to live with great anxiety, guilt, all the rest of it. So you are the in essence humanity. And when you observe your own activity, both physiological and psychological, then you observe it is mechanical, always operating from the background of knowledge. Knowledge has its place, driving a car, doing certain skills, and so on, so on, which we don't have to go into. So there, knowledge is essential. But knowledge in action, psychological action, becomes mechanical. Is this under, are we understanding each other? Please, this is very important, because we are going to go into something that you have to uh, carefully examine, logically, sanely. Because we find, as you observe throughout the world, very few human beings change radically. They change from one pattern to another pattern, from one religious sanctions to another religious sanctions. They become uh, Tibetan monks or Hindu monks, which is the same old pattern repeated over and over and over again. And as one observes, one asks, why doesn't a human being, living as he does, in confusion, in disorder, always in conflict, always struggling, why doesn't he change 
basically. I don't know if you have asked that question of yourself, <coughs> which is, why don't you, as a human being, change most profoundly? Because one sees that one must change, to change not only the society, the corruption, the misery, the confusion, all that is going on outwardly, which is contributed by our inner state, which is our confusion, our disorder, and constant effort, effort, effort. Why do we live in this state? You understand my question? Why? We have infinite knowledge about ourselves, from philosophers, psychologists and others. There are many facts and analysis of, of human beings. And we read them, we listen to them, but we go on, go on our own way, in the same old pattern. Why? Why don't you, as a human being, radically dispel all this? When you ask that question of yourself, you will say probably, I haven't got, the, I haven't got enough energy to battle all this. Is that the question, that you have not enough energy? One has plenty of energy if one wants anything. If you want to climb those mountains, you climb. If you want plenty of money, you work. If you want your sexual appetites satisfied, you drive. If you want to fulfil your ambitions, you are at it day and night. You go, if you want to find some comfort in some religious teacher, and, the, and those are not religious teachers at all. There is no teacher and a taught in religious matters. Please understand this basically. They travel miles, go through great discomfort, live in utter poverty, they have got plenty of energy. But somehow that energy is dissipated in doing all this, in doing something that's not at all worthwhile. The doing of something which is the repetition of a pattern which is not of their own, it's a new pattern, but it's still a pattern. So it is not a question of lack of energy, right? Would you agree to that? Would you see that? Oh, and is it a direction, you understand, to have a direct direction in life? 
like as you have a direction, if you want to become an executive, a foreman, an expert of this, or you have, a dire- you have a, an end in view, a directive. And is there a directive? In the psychological field at all, please under this is very important for us to understand this. We are used to directives, more purposes, an end. And we are asking, is there in the psychological field a purpose at all? an end in view, to be satisfied, to be conquered, to be achieved. So one must go into that question very deeply. That is, biologically there is an end to keep the body healthy, to eat the right food, not to destroy the intelligence, its native intelligence, to have food, clothes and shelter, and biologically to be secure, otherwise you can't, the brain can't function actively. So there is that biological necessity and which becomes a purpose, an end. Now we're asking, is it the biological instinct moving towards psychological state, you know, which says, I must have a purpose? What is the meaning of life? What is the end? What is it all about? So you see, biolog- biologically it may, be mov- it may be the movement in the psychological area. And in the psychological area there is may be no end at all. Do you understand? It may be our illusion moving from one biological instinctive movement to a, a psychological field in which all movement is meaningless. So we are going to examine that. We said human beings, as they are conditioned now, demand, seek, pursue an end apart from the biological. And we are asking if there is a a psychological end at all, which may be enlightenment, God, noble life, you know, all the rest of it. We are questioning all that. What is the psychological field? You understand? Inwardly, what is that? Is that filled by the movements of thought? You understand? The things of thought. Psychological field, which is our consciousness, human consciousness, is that, with its content, is that the result of human struggle, pain, suffering, anxiety, which are all the movement of thought? So, is is that psychological field filled with the things of thought? And thought being matter, 
This, please, you may not have gone into this deeply, or you may have heard some scientists talking about it, but when one observes, one can see very well that thought is a material process, because knowledge is stored up in the brain, which is matter. So thought is a movement in time as process of matter. Right? Sensation, which is the response of all the rest of it. So there is in the brain a movement of thought, all the time operating, mechanistic, endlessly going on and on and on, while you are awake and also while you are asleep. Dreams. All that is going on all the time. And that is our psyche. You understand? Realizing the confusion within that area, thought says, Is there a purpose? Is there an end? Is there a goal? Is there a freedom? You understand all this? I hope we are meeting all this, are we? Please, for this morning or few mornings, put away all your prejudices, hmm? all your anxieties and demands, sexual this, that. Just listen, would you? I'm telling you something lovely, something which is effortless, something very beautiful. Just listen to it. Don't fight it. Not accept it. Just you know, as you listen to the river. Just listen, and then the, you will find if the seed is true, it will take place. Then it will blossom. And our action is from this area of knowledge. And therefore, action is never complete. It is always regretting, always foreseeing and not being able to fulfil, so there is always frustration. Right? So we are asking, why do human beings living in this chaos, misery, why is it they don't change? Some of you have listened to this speaker, unfortunately, for fifty years. Why in the name of heaven haven't you changed? Radical, not superficially just dropping one church or this or that, that's all trivial stuff. So one, one demands, why? We said it's not the lack of energy, you've got plenty of energy to come here, sit in this hot tent, travel all round and come and listen, you've got plenty of energy. Is it the lack of will? Will implies... No, um, let's begin slowly. What is will? I will do this. I won't do that. I must and must not. What is this will which plays such tremendous part in our life? Please 
uh, go into it with me, not accepting what the speaker is saying. Find out for yourself in heaven's name what will is, because that plays such an extraordinary part in our life. I must give up smoking. I must not do this. And so on. What is that will? It's a movement, isn't it? Hmm? Obviously. A movement in a direction, in a particular direction, either the negative direction or the positive direction, but it's a direction. Please listen carefully. When there is a direction, there is time involved. I am here and I must be there. I am angry, I must get rid of anger. There. So will is a movement in time. Right? Please. And what is that, the essence of that will? What, what brings about or what generates that will? Do you understand my question? As long as you have a directive, an end, you must have a will. So what is the nature and the structure of will? When you say, I will do that, what is that? And when you say, I will not do that, or mustn't do that, the movement, what is that that takes place? Is it opposing desires, the desire that says, I will, and the desire that says, I will not? So desire. Desire, strengthened, concentrated, is will. Right? Opposing. Or completely unified. Follow? So, what is desire? Please listen, you understand? We are used to being conditioned to exercise will. You, you smoke, begin to smoke gradually, it comes into habit, and then And you find it is necessary to have that habit, and you say, I must fight it. I must get rid of it. For various biological or emotional or psychological reasons. So will is the essence of desire. And what is desire? We are examining this because we are trying to find out why human beings don't change. After millennia, you understand? Why live in this miserable way? We said we have got plenty of energy, and now we are asking, is it the lack of will? And we are examining the nature of will, the structure of it, how it is formed, how it comes into being. So, we said, desire is the essence of will. So what is desire? Please examine 
through my words, speaker's words, the issue in yourself. Desire is sensation plus thought plus the image which thought creates. You understand? Sensation, seeing something and want seeing, then the thought taking over the observation, then thought creating the image. This sensation plus thought plus this plus the image. Right? That is desire. From that all our activity of will takes place. So the question is, as long as there is a will, there is a directive, and therefore movement towards that direction, positive or negative. And That is the pattern which we are used to, having, having sensations, thought, and thought plus sensation creating the image, the image that I must be that, the image that I must not be that. You follow? All that is will, and that we have exercised that will endlessly. The socialists, the communists, the religious people, the non-religious people, this movement is all the time going on. That's our conditioning. Which is, in the psychological field, this movement of desire plus thought and image is constant. And as long as that mechanistic process goes on, there cannot be change. There cannot be psychological deep revolution. So how can this movement come to an end? You understand my question? I wonder if you understand all this. Is this becoming a bit difficult? You understand, I'm a human being. I've lived in the pattern of agony, suppression, quarrels, violence, bitterness, an occasional feeling of tenderness, occasional sense of something which I have dreamt of or dreamed, I feel immense, all that. I have lived like that as a human being. <coughs> and I say to myself, why am I living this way? I know I will die, there is always death, but I lived during that 50, 20, 30, 80 years in a squalid uh, pigsty way. Why? Is it lack of. I won't come to that yet. Is it lack of energy? I see I've got plenty of energy and I want to do something. Is it lack of will? And I begin to examine the will, the whole nature of will. And that's my habit conditioning. Now I'm questioning if I can break that habit, if that habit can be broken, that is, not to operate on will at all. You understand? Will only takes, comes into being, please listen comes into being when sensation, which is natural, which is acceptable, which is normal, sane, when that sensation is taken over by thought 
and that thought creates the image. So is it possible to be completely wholly with sensation and no interference of thought? You understand what I'm saying? You see a beautiful house, beautiful woman, nice man, see the hills and the glory of the earth. When you observe, there's tremendous sensation, if you are at all watching. And then thought comes along and says, yes, how marvellous! From that begins the image-making, the picture-making, the imagination. Now, is it possible to have this complete sensation, which is normal, healthy, sane, and not let thought seep in? You understand? When thought seeps in, you have the projection of tomorrow. I don't know if you see that. You see something extraordinarily beautiful, and all your senses are awake. Then thought comes along and says, I must have it tomorrow, which is the image making, the pleasure, you follow? The delight of something beautiful. Thought has taken over, created an image, and therefore there is tomorrow. You understand? So the tomorrow is the process of time, which is thought. So in the psyche there is only sensation, no tomorrow. I wonder if you see this. This little bit complex, is it? I see some people are not. <laughs> Let me explain it more. We live in the hope of tomorrow. Right? Tomorrow to us is tremendously important. As yesterday, the images of yesterday, the, all that is as important, the past, as tomorrow. So we live in the past and we, tomorrow becomes tremendously significant. So psychologically we are saying, what is tomorrow? There is tomorrow, which is Friday, <laughs> we have to do certain things, but psychologically we are asking, what is tomorrow? <coughs> tomorrow is the directive. Please do see the beauty of this. Tomorrow is the directive, <coughs> the end, the goal. And so tomorrow psychologically assumes a great significance. And psychologically, inwardly, the tomorrow is the movement of thought in time. Movement of thought as a material process in time. Tomorrow is a measurement, right? Where there is a measurement, there must be illusion. Oh, come on! I'm afraid you don't see all this. Look, measurement means comparing. I am not so beautiful as you are. I am not so intelligent as you are. Right? 
I want to be as intelligent as you are, which is measurement. Comparison is measurement. So thought is a process of comparison. So thought is measurement, which is the directive from what is what to what should be. Right? Now, is there Now, is there such thing as tomorrow in the psychological world? If I live with tomorrow, then it's a mechanistic process, right? Because thought has created tomorrow, psychologically. That may be an illusion altogether. So, I must, I must as a human being, I must find out. Because that's the pattern, that's the conditioning, that's the accepted norm of existence, which may be totally absurd. Because I'm concerned as a human being with the radical transformation, and we are examining the will, the will in action. And will in action means tomorrow, the directive. And is there such thing as tomorrow, psychologically, apart from biologically, physically? I need time, there is tomorrow, if I have to learn a language, if I have to learn to drive a car, and so on, so on. So is there a tomorrow? There is no tomorrow when when there is only sensation. And no image and no thought. I wonder if you capture it. Do you get it? See, people, especially so called religious people, the monks throughout the world, have said sensation is totally wrong, control it. Because sensation leads to desire. And desire means the woman or the man. God cannot accept a man who has desire. You know, you have heard all this stuff put in different words. Therefore, suppress desire. Therefore, control all your sensations. Because if you don't, you are in, in the devil's hand. So we are saying something quite opposite, which is, sensation is natural. Sensation must exist, it does exist, it's a fact. If you don't have your sensation fully alert, you are paralysed. You may be paralysed, because we have learned the art of suppressing. So, there is this, all your sensations. When that sensations meet the movement of thought, then there is tomorrow. Because thought is a fragment. Thought is a fragment because it is based on yesterday's memory. Thought is never whole. So, sensation totally is whole, therefore there is no tomorrow. You understand all this? Don't agree with me. Please, do it. See see what happens when you do. Look at those hills, at anything. Look at it with all your senses fully awakened. Senses, not only your brain, your mind, because mind is part of the sensations, matter, and all your sensations. Then you will see thought comes along and the image making begins and tomorrow will happen. But when there is only complete sensation, 
without the movement of thought, there is only now, no tomorrow. Oh, I wonder if you see this. So, is it because we have no energy that we don't change? And we see we have got energy. Whenever we want to do something, we break everything to do it. And is it the lack of will? We see the mischief of will. So there is an action which is born not out of will, but out of the perception of this movement of will. You understand? So there is an action which is not born from an image, which is fragmentary, but an action born out of total awareness, which is total sense of uh, sensation. This is, please, this is very important, all this. Don't mis- if you misunderstand, it's not my fault. Then, if it is not lack of energy, then will has no place. Hmm? Then what, why is it that human beings haven't changed? Is it that they are always thinking of reward and punishment, which is the motive for our operation? We are brought up from childhood on that basis. Reward if you are good, punish if you are not. Reward if you struggle, uh, climb the ladder, you are rewarded. You become the executive or the president of God knows what else, or the bishop. So there is, our conditioning is based on reward and punishment, which is the motive. A motive based on reward and punishment. Motive means a movement. The word itself means a movement. See what is implied. moment you have a motive, the movement is time. So you say, I will take time to change. If it is not reward and punishment, then it is, it is I am going to have now whatever you reward. So, where there is a motive, there is a direction, and the direction is set by thought, and so tomorrow. So, as long as there is a motive, all action is incomplete. Isn't it? If I love you because you give me food, this, that, and the comfort, and all the rest of it, <laughs> it's my motive. It isn't love. So, is there an action without motive? You understand my question? Moment I have a motive as a human being. My, whatever I do is partial, fragmentary, which will bring about regret, pain, suffering, all the rest of it. So I'm asking, as a human being, is there an action without a motive? Don't translate it into saying love. Because that word is so abused, so heavily laden. Don't bring in that word, we'll discuss it another time. So is there an action in which there is no tomorrow, no will, only total energy? Isn't it? When you have total energy, there is total action. You understand? I wonder if you get this. 
Look, we are fragmented human beings. Go to the office, or the factory, or the garden, and that's a field by itself, and our family is a field by itself. My ambitions, my desires is another fragmentation. So we live in fragments, right? That's a fact. And so any action born of those fragment, fragmentation must be inevitably incomplete and therefore always destructive, frightening, regretting, sorrow and all the rest of it. So I say, as a human being, is there an action in which all this doesn't exist? You understand? You must ask that question, you are not asking it. I am asking it. If you ask it, not superficially, because this is a tremendous thing, this, to discover, you will find, as a human being, a human being who represents the whole world of humanity, you will find there is an action which is not of tomorrow, the ideal, the directive, but an action that springs from that total energy which is total sensation. So, then what is it further that human beings have not, for what reason further that human beings have not changed? You understand? We said it's lack of energy. Is it lack of energy? Is it will? Is it incomplete action with which you are familiar? And is there another thing that is impeding why human beings don't fundamentally change? Is there another? Of course, there are many others <laughs> who will take the fundamental things, not superficial, fragmentary things – energy, will, complete action, and is it that in all of us there is a longing for something other than what is. You understand my question? A longing of something beyond all this mess, a happiness, a deliverance, Something that thought has never touched it. You understand? Something eternal, nameless, doesn't matter what name you give it. Is that one of the reasons that we don't change? You understand my question? I live a miserable, sordid, sordy life, and I see it around me, everybody more or less the same pattern, and my parents, grandparents, past, past, past parents have lived the same way, and I feel I cannot escape from this. I feel that I am chained, bound. And 
I want something beyond all this. And that may be one of the reasons I don't change. A capito. Ah, this is very important. Oh, I'm so hot. Cioè lei dice noi non cambiamo perché di questa cosa facciamo una nuova direzione, un nuovo soggetto di volontà. Sì. Un momento, parliamo. You understand? The priests throughout the world, the Christian, the Buddhist, the Hindu, the Tibetan priests, have always said there's a promise of something greater. Do this and you'll go to heaven. And if you don't, you'll go to hell. Which is interpreted in Hindu different ways and so on, so on, which is irrelevant. So our minds are conditioned heavily by something other than what is. The other is the promised land, the never, never land, the heaven, the enlightenment, the nirvana, the moksha of the Hindus. Because I don't know what to do with this, with what is, and my whole longing is that. Put it in different ways. It may be the communists may want perfect state, perfect environment. It's the same problem, you understand? It's the same issue, only put in different words, the tomorrow. So that may be, I'm asking, one of the fundamental reasons why human beings don't change, because they have this, the perfect highest principle, called in India Brahman, Nirvana by the Buddhists, Heaven by the Christians, and so on, so on, so on. That may be one of the fundamental reasons why human beings don't change. The perfect ideal, the perfect man or woman, which means the what is is not important, but that is important. The perfect ideal is important. The perfect state is important. The highest, the nameless is important. So don't bother with what is, don't look at what is, but translate what is in terms of what should be. You understand all this? I hope I'm getting at you. So we have created a duality, the what should be and what is. And we are saying that may be one of the great reasons why human beings don't change. When there is this division between what is and what should be the highest, then there is conflict. Right? The Arab and the Jew division. Wherever there is a division, there must be conflict. That's a law. So I have, I have, uh, be, we have been conditioned in this division. To accept this division, to live in this division, the what is and what should be. The what should be has been brought about because I don't know how to deal with what is. Or the what should be is a lever you to get rid of what is. So it's a conflict. So why does the mind? has created the 
the what should be. You understand my question? And not be concerned totally with what is. Why have why has the mind done this? Why has thought done this? Thought, if it is at all aware, knows it has created what is. And thought says, this is a fragment, this is transitory, that is permanent. You understand? This is, what is it transitory? And what thought has created the highest principle is permanent. Thought thinks that. This is impermanent, that is permanent. Both the creation of thought. Right? God, Saviour, all created by thought, the what should be. So, thought has created this division. And then thought says, I cannot solve this, but I am going to approach that. When, when you see the truth of this, that doesn't exist. Only this remains. I wonder if you see this. Right? Do you see this? Thought has created the perfect ideal, the perfect state, the perfect nirvana, the perfect moksha, perfect heaven. Thought has created it, because it does not know what to do with this, with what is, with my sorrow, with my agony, with my impenetrable ignorance. And so the thought has created this division. Do you see the truth of it? Not the verbal agreement, not the acceptable, logical acceptance of this, but the truth of it. Then if you see the truth of it, that doesn't exist. The ideal perfectly, that doesn't exist, because you know nothing about it. It's a merely a projection of thought. So you have the energy then to deal with what is. Instead of going, losing that energy in there, you have the energy to deal with, ex- with what is happening. You see the difference? Oh, for God's sake! Do you see it? So you have this energy to deal with what is. Then you have to learn how to look at what is. You understand? To observe what is. Therefore you have no longer the duality of what should should not be, only what is. You are beginning to see the, the implications of it? When there is no what should be, the highest principle, you have only this. This is a fact, that is not fact. So you can deal with facts. When there is no duality, there is only one thing. Say, for instance, violence. There is only violence, not non-violence. Right? The non-violence is what should be. So when you see the truth of it, there is only violence. Right? Now, you have the energy to deal with that violence. What is violence? Okay, go into it with me for a moment. Violence, anger, 
competition, comparison, imitation, imitation being, I am this, I must be that. So, violence psychologically is comparison, imitation, various forms of conformity, essentially comparison. I am this, I must be that. That is violence, not just throwing bombs, physical violence, that's something quite different. That is brought about by our rotten society, immoral society and all the rest of it, we don't go into it. <coughs> so, there is only violence, this thing. What is important there? What is the nature of it? You understand? We have described more or less what is violence. You may not agree with the description, but you know what we mean by violence. Jealousy, anger, hatred, annoyance, arrogance, vanity, all part of that structure of violence. That violence comes with the picture, with the image I have. That's part of my image. Now, can the mind be free of the image? You understand? As long as I have, there is an image, a picture, I must be violent. The picture is formed through sensation plus thought and the image. You are following this? So as lo- I real- human being realizes that as long as there is this image created by sen- true sensation plus thought, as long as that image, which is me, exists, I must be violent. Violence means me and you. We and they. You know, that's what. So, violence is there as long as this image exists. And that image is sensation and thought. So, there is no image if there is only complete sensation. So, you can deal then with what is. You understand? I wonder if you understand this. Look, I'm angry, or I hate somebody. I don't, but we'll take that as an example. I hate somebody because he has done something ugly, hurt me, all the rest of it. My instinctual response, being a fairly intelligent, fairly normal human being, say, I mustn't hate him, it's bad. I have now two images. I hate and I mustn't hate. Two images. So there's a battle between these two images. One says control, suppress, chain, don't yield, mm, yield. You follow that goes on all the time, as long as these two images exist. And I know the image is formed through, I've realized very deeply, through sensation plus thought. That's a fact. I've realized that. So, I put away non-hate. You understand? I've only this feeling of annoyance, anger, hatred. 
What is that feeling? Created through the image by some action of another. Right? You have done something to the image, which is me. And that image is hurt. And from reaction of that hurt is anger. And if I have no image, thought, sensation, if I have no image, you don't touch me. You understand? There is no wounding, there is no hate, which is what is. Now I know, I'm aware how, what to do with the what is. You understand? Now have you got something of. So I have found human beings <coughs> don't change because they are wasting their energy, don't change because they are exercising their right of will, which they think is extraordinary, noble, which is called freedom of choice. And also, they don't know what to do with what is, and therefore project what should be, and also maybe because that the, the nirvana, the moksha, the heaven is far more important than what is. You follow? These are the blocks that human beings don't change. Why do they don't radically transform themselves? If you have understood this deeply, you understand with your blood, with your heart, with your all your senses, then you will see there is an extraordinary transformation without the least effort. Has will a place in life? Would you give me two minutes rest? Has will a place in life? What do you mean by life? What do we mean by life? Going to the office every day, having a profession, a career, The everlasting climbing the ladder, both religiously and mundanely, the fears, the, tre- the agonies, the things that we have treasured, remembered, all that's life, isn't it? Right? All that is life, both the conscious as well as the hidden. The conscious of which we know, more or less. And that is all the deep down hidden things in the cave of one's mind, in the most deepest recesses of one's mind. All that is life. The illusion and the re- and the reality. The highest principle and the avoidance of what is. The fear of death, the fear of living, fear of relationship, all that. What place 
has will in all that? That's the question. I say it has no place. Don't accept what I'm saying, please. I'm not your authority, I'm not your guru. All this, the content of one's consciousness, which is consciousness, is created by thought, which is desire and the image. And that's what has brought about such havoc in the world. Is there a way of living? In this, without the action of will. That's the gentleman's question. I know this. As a human being, I'm fully aware of what is exactly going on within my consciousness. The confusion, the disorder, the chaos, the battle, the seeking for power, position, safety, security, prominence, fame, oh, all that business. And I see thought has created all that, thought plus desire, and the multiplication of images. And I say, what, what place has will in this? It's will that has created this. Now, can I live? Please listen, Kef. Can I live in this without will? Biologically, physiologically, I have to exercise a certain form of energy to learn a language, to do this and that. There must be a certain drive. Here, I see all this, and I realise, not as a verbal realisation, as a description, but the actual fact of it, as a factual as a pain in the leg. I realise it and I say, this is the product of thought as desire and will. And can I, as a human being, look at all this, transform this without will? So, what becomes important is <coughs> how what kind of observation is necessary? You understand? Observation to see actually what is. Is, um, is the mind capable of seeing actually what is, or does it always translate into what should be, what should not be? I must suppress, I must not suppress, and all the rest of it. Right? So. There must be freedom to observe, otherwise I can't see. Right? If I'm prejudiced against you um, or like you, I can't see you. So freedom is absolutely necessary to observe. Freedom from my prejudice, from my information, from what I have learned. To look, the, to look without the idea. You understand? Yes, but I am finished. To look without the idea. As we said the other day, the word idea comes from Greek, which means to observe, not what we have made of it. The root meaning of that word is to observe, to see. When we refuse to see, we make an abstraction and make it into an idea. So there must be freedom to observe. And in that freedom, will is not necessary, it is just freedom to look, which is, may I put it differently?
If one makes a statement, can you listen to it without an abs- making of it into an abstraction? Do you understand my question? I make a statement, speaker makes a statement, as the ending of sorrow is the beginning of wisdom. The speaker says that. Can you listen to that statement without making an abstraction of it? The abstraction being, is that possible? What do you get from it? Is that how to do it? Those are all abstractions and not actually listening. You so can you listen to that statement with all your senses, which means with all your attention? Then you see the truth of it. And the perception of that truth is action in that chaos. Got it? That's enough for this morning, isn't it? <laughs>